So I'm going to talk about Ecto. And for those of you who don't know, Ecto is a database library. Um, and I started working on Ecto almost two years ago. Um, and I worked on it as a summer project. And I worked for it for, uh, for full time for about three months. Uh, during the period, I was mentored by Joseva Lim. Um, and that was a great experience for me. It was the first big Elixir project I did. And it was before I was a, a, a team member. Uh, and, it was, and, it was, and it was because of this project that I got to talk with Jose. And, and I started contributing more to Core Elixir. And I could eventually become a, a core team member. So I'm going to, throw, to talk about four things uh, today. Uh, first off, we have the query language, um, which is an embedded language that we use for building and composing queries. Uh, secondly, the repository, which is the main interface for the database, uh, which we talk the database from uh, Ecto. Thirdly, the models, which is how we model database tables uh, with structs in, in, in Elixir. Uh, and finally, talk about change sets, which is how we apply changes to models and cost and validate data. So first off, we have the query language. And there's quite a lot of prior work on embedded query languages. Um, not so much in functional programming. There's lots of prior work in, in uh, object-oriented programming, um, like all the object-relational object, all the object relational, uh, mappers. Um, but uh, we were basing a lot of it uh, from LINK. And LINK stands for Language Integrated Query. And notice here that they call it language integrated query. And that means that when link was created, it was added on top of existing languages. And as it was added, they had to extend the syntax of, 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 of those languages. And they had to release new versions of those language with new specs that, that incorporated the link syntax. But in Elixir, we don't have to do that because we have metaprogramming and we have macros. Uh, so we don't have to add new syntax to the language. We can just create a library and use the existing tools for building DSLs. So this is how Link looks like uh, in C Sharp. Um, so this is all syntax in C Sharp. And this will compile down to uh, this set of change, uh, chain method calls. Um, and so it was Microsoft that created a link and they added it to C Sharp, uh, F Sharp, and Visual Basic.net. And as they were adding link to the language, they also added a, a bunch of functional programming to the language. So uh, if you look here, we're uh, is just the eno filter we have in Elixir, and select is just a functional map. Um, so it's very close to functional programming, and they were also adding anonymous functions. Um, and all of this, um, so we were basing this on link, and but one of the biggest differences that the query language in Elixir has from link is that um, the link syntax also works for in-memory collections. Um, as you see, it just so posts could just be swapped out to a list or, an, or, or any kind of collection. And you can run this. Um, it works on, on the collections. Um, and in Elixir, we already kind of had that with the, uh, with, the, with the existing functional programming uh, we had in the, 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 in the innumerable module. Um, 
And the reason we didn't go this way is because there's a lot of execution semantical differences with databases and in-memory collections. Uh, for example, um, databases have, I have indexes. So this kind of query can execute very fast on a database because this is just an I index lookup. But on in-memory collections, uh, you would have to, you would have to you would have to uh, go o over the whole collection. So even though they have the same syntax, you can't really write the same kind of queries for in-memory collections and, and, and for databases. Uh, so, that's why we, so that's why we didn't go down that road. Um, so this is what the query syntax looks like. Uh, this particular query returns all posts that are tagged with e e Elixir. Um, and it all starts out with the from macro, which you can't really see has been highlighted here, but I'm, I'm trying to highlight the from macro. Um, and, and that macro receives two arguments. First off, we have the, the first argument, which is the source of the query. And the source of the query is what we call a queryable, which I will talk about more later. We also bind the source to the p variable so that we can reference it later here and with p tags. The second argument is the actual query expressions, uh, which is a keyword list. Um, here you would have your where's, your selects, order bys, group bys, and so on. And you can even pass in multiple where's that we combine uh, with the uh, and. Um, and we'll also su support interpolation in the queries. And interpolations are, so, all of the query is not really executed as Elixir code, except for the things that we prefix with the hat operator. So every all this, so the from macro receives a syntax tree, and we escape everything in that in that tree, so that there, so that it's not e e e evaluated. Instead, it's instead it's stored as the terms for the syntax tree, right? And as we are, and, and as we're, uh, and as we are traversing the syntax tree, and we see the hat operator, we stop escaping for that expression. So this part will not be be escaped. Rather, it will just be evaluated as e Elixir code. So that's how we can inject e Elixir values into the queries. Um, and the injected e Elixir values will eventually become query parameters. And since there are query parameters, we are, we are safe from SQL injections in this case. We can also compose queries. Um, so I mentioned, so that's what I mentioned earlier, that ECTA queries are composable, and it's a very important, and that's a very <coughs> important part of the queries. And what I mean with that there are, and what I mean when I say composable is that we can take an existing query, and we can extend it, and add more things to it. So this is the early query that I show you, um, which returns a bunch of posts. And say that we want to paginate this. So, so to paginate a set of results is pretty simple. We limit the results so that we only get the number of results that we want per page. And then we need to offset um, to the location, to the page that we're currently on. And this is pretty easy. Um, also here you can notice that we are interpolating the two values um, from the function arguments. Um, but we're kind of um, we're kind of mixing two two things here. So we so we both have the fetching post part, and we have the page net part. So if we can split those things, that would be very good. So I'm not sure if you can see what I marked here, but the marked things here are only related to page uh, to paginating, and paginating is kind of the same for uh, for uh, for all result sets. So 
We can extract that into a separate function. And notice here that the function takes a query. And since it's the first argument, we can, we can just take the, the result from Elixir post from, so we can just take the result that this function returns, so the original query, uh, and we pipe that into the PageNate function, and that's how we can, can compose the, the part that returns posts and the part that PageNates, right? Um, <coughs> And because we can easily compose queries, we don't need special macros for creating scopes. So a scope is simply a function that accepts a query and extends that query, returns the query with the new constraints from the scope. And we also have an internal sort of syntax you can write this with. So this is a kind of a shorter syntax you can sometimes use. So the the from micro here from the, from the previous slide actually, uh, when we expand the from micro, we actually expand it to this, this code. And this syntax, I prefer the, to use the keyword syntax here, but when you're, but when you're writing one-liners or short functions, the syntax can also be useful sometimes. And I mentioned earlier that the first argument of from accepts a queryable. So we have seen where the from, arg uh, where the from argument is, um, can be a post, which is a model. Uh, it can also be a query, uh, which we see here. Uh, and both those uh, are um, and, and both those terms implement the queryable protocol. It's a very simple protocol. It's just have a single function called toQuery. And it takes anything that implements it and it converts it to a query struct. Um, so anything that implements the queryable, uh, anything that implements the queryable protocol can be queried on. And Ecto ships with four implementations of this protocol. First we have the query struct that has a very simple imp implementation of toQuery. It just returns itself. We also have atoms, and atoms in this case are module names, which are the models, right? Uh, you can also, uh, so you can also query on strings, which is of the binary type. Uh, and that's what we call a source in Ecto. So, so that's just a string, uh, which for SQL databases would be a table name. Um, so you can query directly on table names. Um, so you can do dynamic queries that way. And it works just like querying on models, except you lose a few conveniences, like type checking, which I'll talk about later. And we can't create a model struct, of course. We can't create that uh, for the results. Uh, you can also query on source model tuples. So you can get the benefits of using a model, but you can also switch out the table that you are querying on. We also support uh, fragments. Uh, SQL fragments. Um, so for example, there's no down case uh, function in Ecto queries. So instead we can create a SQL fragment that uh, calls the, uh, the SQL function lower. And each, each question mark here will become a parameter to the fragment function. So we can pass in a field and we can also pass in an interpolated value. And again, this is safe from SQL injections because from is a macro, so we can check that the arguments to fragment are actually string literals. So we, so we won't accept uh, dynamic values there. And we also recently added um, expanding on macros. So if you don't want to, to write long fragment functions like this, 
you can you can wrap um, you can wrap this in a macro that expands to a fragment, so you can so you can create your so you can create your own lower function. And we do type checking on all expressions, um, and we also do type checking when you insert data. And that's mostly added as a convenience because most same databases do the type checking for you. Um, except for databases like MySQL. So, for, so if your database is MySQL, this is very helpful. It's also helpful that you don't get an error message from the database because then you get the SQL syntax right. Um, so with our type checking, we can show the location exactly in the Ecto query where, um, where there was a type problem. So next one, I'm going to talk about the repository, which we call the repo in Ecto, because we like short names and we're lazy, so we don't like to t type repository all the time. Um, so the repo is completely decoupled from models and queries, and that means that you can create one query and you can, mul and you can run it against multiple repositories. And you can have one model that you can persist against different repository and thereby different databases. And every, all the database actions in Ecto goes through the repo. So it's very explicit where you query against the database. So it's harder to have accidental database queries uh, like you can have in some object relational mappers. So it, this kind of makes everything explicit, and it's and it more and it more clearly shows when you have like n plus one problems. Um, so the repository has a bunch of functions, like all that returns all the results from a query. We can insert models. Uh, we have delete all queries that deletes all records that match the query. And what the repository does is that it's just calls into a database adapters. We have adapters for um, for Postgres and MySQL that we, that we ship with. Uh, there's also a hex package that has SQL server support, so that's really cool. And the adapter holds a pool of connections to the database, uh, and we use a library called Poolboy for that. Um, and via the repository, a, a, a user can, can check in and check out connections in a sort of transaction. Um, and so only one process at a time can hold a connection, so we don't have issues where a connection is used by multiple processes at the same time. And since each connection is in a separate process, we have isolated failures. Um, and so this is kind of what it looks like. So each dot here is a separate process, and each arrow here is a link. And so if a process uh, is to die for some kind of reason, like the connection went die, maybe there's a bug in your driver or anything like that, um, the process will exit, it will trigger the link that will also send an exit to the, to the repository, uh, to, the, to the pool in the repository. But the pool is configured to trap the exits. And that means instead of just killing the repository, the, rep uh, the repository will receive a message that it can handle. So when the process finally dies, the, the repository can handle this message and just spawn a new process. Um, and also, since links are bi-directional, if we were to stop the repository or stop our, our application for some reason, uh, all the connections will also be killed with it. So, so we can't have issues where we accidentally leave uh, that we accidentally leave connections running. Uh, yes, I mentioned the adapters that we ship with and the SQL Server support. Um, next one I'm going to talk about the model. 
Um, the model is where we define the database records. Uh, and we do that with a schema. The first argument to the schema macro is the source, which in SQL databases is just the name of a database table. Uh, the second argument is a block of code where we define um, the fields. Uh, and, and each field has a name, of course. We also give it the type. And this is the types we use when we type checking queries and we check that we insert correct data and so on. Um, so this macro will create a struct with all the fields in the schema. It will also generate a few introspection functions that basically return the types of the different fields, all the fields that a table has, which we use in adapters and so on, and we use for the type checking, of course. It will also automatically create a primary key. You can override this so that you can have no primary key if you, if you don't want that. Um, you can also override the type of the primary key. So, so by default, it's an integer. But if you use, uh, but if you use some kind of other type for the primary key, you can, you can change that. We also have callbacks uh, in the model. Um, a callback will execute before or after you do an insert, update, delete, or load something from the database. And you specify it like this. You have like before insert, or before update, uh, a function name, and a list of arguments that you want to pass to, to that function. Um, so here we have an, a, an example how you could implement automatic timestamping when you insert or update a record. Um, as you see here, the first argument is, is a change set. Uh, I'll get to change it in just a moment and explain what those are. Um, and one thing we try to really explain when we talk about callbacks is that you should only use it for ensuring data consistency. You shouldn't use callbacks for application logic because that doesn't really fit the, the concept for, for callbacks. Um, and with callbacks, you can do stuff like timestamps, which I show here. You can do uh, optimistic locking, which is a way of ensuring that no one uh, that no one updates the record while you are changing it, um, and so on. We also have associations, uh, which look like this. We have has many, has one, and belongs to. And you define those associations in the schema. Um, and this is very straightforward if you're used to, uh, uh, and if, if you're used to libraries like Rails, it works very much the same. Um, so first off, we have has many, uh, which define an association to comment, which we call comments, and has many assumes that there is a a belongs to on the other side, uh, on the comment side. Um, and it also assumes that there are one, uh, that there are no or that there are none or many comments. Has one works the same except that it only assumes that there is there is one association per post. Um, and like I say, belongs to is what you would define on the other side. So, so the has associations. Um, Assume that there are field on the other side that is called so for so for uh, since since this is a a post model it's it assumes there's a field on the other side called post ID uh, and that is exactly the field that belongs to will generate mm, but in this case it will be a, a user ID right here it will be a user ID. Um, we also have has many through associations. And that means, for example, if, so assume that each comment has a user as well. So we could assume a, so we could define an association called comment authors, uh, which we say is going through comment and that is going through comments and authors. So you can, ex you can directly access all the authors of the comments to the post. 
Uh, we're, we also plan to support many-to-many -many associations, but that's not implemented yet. And you can query on these associations. Um, for example, you can preload. What preload means is that, uh, so, so, so there's two ways to query on, on associations. There's preload and there's join, right? Uh, when we do a join, that's a normal SQL database join. Uh, the only special thing is that we do is that since, since this will return a, a new post for every comment, so the result set would have multiple posts. So you would have, you would have multiple to see that we, that we can bind um, the join in a new variable, and we can use that variable in the rest of the query. So we can select on, on specific fields on the comment and so on. We can use it uh, in where's, uh, if we want to group something or if, we want to, and, or if we want to do something else with it. Um, Next one we have we have chain sets. Um, chain sets is how we take uh, external data and persist them. So a chain set so chain set does three three major th three major things. It costs it costs external uh, it costs external parameters. For so example, if you have uh, a web app, all the um, input would, so all the parameters could be strings if you have like uh, get parameters. So we can cast, uh, so we can cast those strings to the field uh, on the model where we want to persist that. So if there's an ID, for example, we can, we can, we can cast a string to uh, the integer in that field, right? Um, and we will also, the, the chain set also validates data. So we have validations that we can run against the chain set. It will also track changes. So if, we, um, if we're updating something, it will only send the, the changes in the chain set to the database instead of updating the whole model. Um, and this is, how you would define a, a chain set. So the first argument here is a user model. The second argument is external parameters. Um, the third and fourth argument are the parameters that we want to use. So the third argument is the required parameters. If any of those are missing, we will store and we will store and and uh, that as an uh, we will we will make that change it invalid. Uh, the fourth argument are the optional uh, parameters. So we will only use these parameters from the from the input. Uh, this is also where you define your validations, which you just pipe through. Um, and the validations will also store. Uh, will also mark 
we change it as invalid if there was any validation problems. So the usual convention is that you define this function on your model, um, which you call chain set. And below here we have an example of how you would call that. So uh, this could be in your web server, this could be like a callback for a, for a post request, which takes a, a connection and the, and the parameters for that request. Um, so first off, we call uh, the function we have above here. We pass it a, a new model and the parameters from the request. Um, next one, we check if, the, if everything was valid. So it would not be valid if there are missing parameters, if any of the costing failed, uh, if any of the validation failed, and so on. And if it is value, uh, and if it is valid, we can insert it, return OK. If not, we can return the same shit errors uh, and show what went wrong. And uh, an insert here, here will uh, insert everything from the model, including the changes from the chain set. Update, though, uh, kind of does uh, dirty tracking. It will only send the things that we actually that was actually changed. So only the parameters, it, so it will only send the input parameters. Um, so Ecto comes with a bunch of types that it supports out of the box, like strings, integers, binaries, uh, arrays, and so on. Uh, but you can extend this with your own custom types. And this is how we do, uh, and this is how we can uh, cost input parameters. Uh, we also need to say how, so that could be any custom type. So we also need to say how to load and dump those to the database. So one example for using custom active types is in HexWeb, which is the uh, server part of the Hex package manager. So this is the releases table, which lists all, re all releases for packages. And we need to do some validation on the parameters when someone uploads a new release. Uh, one of those are versions, because for example, one is we only accept semantic versioning. So we, so we need to do some validations on the version, right? So what we can do is create a version ectotype, uh, which looks like this. Um, ectotype is a behavior. Uh, it has uh, four functions that you need to implement, type, cast, load, and dump. Type is very simple. It just returns the underlying database type uh, for the value. Cost it what is what takes uh, the parameter and costs it to the version struct. So version is a struct that chips with Core Elixir that handles the semantic versioning in e Elixir. So we automatically handle the version struct. That's very easy to cost. Uh, and if it's a string, like from a web request, we can parse that. If there's a parse error, it will return error. Uh, if the parsing was successful, it will return an, an OK tuple with this, with the first argument is the OK atom, the second argument is the uh, version struct. And if it doesn't match either the version struct or a string, we we'll automatically treat that as an error because we don't know what to do with it. And that will be marked as an error on the change set. The change set would be marked as invalid, and we would send a validation failure as response as the response uh, to the web request. We also need to tell Ecto how to load the database value. So as I said, the underlying database value is just a string. So like a varchar or a text type for SQL databases. Um, so that's how Ecto loads it. We also need to tell Ecto how to 
have to dump it down to the string value again, and that's just a call to two string that cannot fail. So we, to, so we wrap it in the OK tuple. Um, so this is kind of how you extend um, Ecto's types, and it's how you can define um, casting for types that Ecto doesn't support. So I think this is a very useful feature. Um, Finally, the last thing I want to talk about is how uh, Phoenix and Ecto integrate. So Phoenix doesn't ship with a database layer. Um, instead, it defines protocols that are kind of the injection points for a database layer. So there are four, there are four protocols in, in Phoenix uh, that can be extended. Uh, for a database adapter. First, we have form data, which is, if you remember from Chris's talk, he showed, um, when he showed the generators, he showed uh, like how you can insert a new posts. And that uses form data. So uh, the Phoenix Ecto project, which you can find here, implements form data for chain sets. So with this, we can automatically give Phoenix knowledge about the errors in the change sets. It knows about the fields on the model and so on. We also have HTML safe, that is, um, which we implement for, which is how Phoenix ensures that uh, you don't have like cross-site uh, cross scripting and so on. So if something is not HTML safe, it will be escaped. If it is safe, it will not be escaped. Uh, we implement this for some Ecto types that are that are safe, like uh, decimals, date times, date times, and so on. Uh, Phoenix also ships with Poison, which is its JSON parser and encoder. So we implement that for the same Ecto types. We also implement plug exception, which is a very simple protocol. It just takes an exception and returns the, ADP, the HTTP status code for, for that exceptions. So for example, a, a cost error would be uh, a 400 bad request. Um, a no results error from, uh, from Ecto would be a 404 not found um, status code. Um, so that's very cool and it kind of shows how Elixir has very good extensibility so we can, sh so we can we can have a, a separate web framework library and database library and still make them communicate in a very nice manner. Um, so that's it about Ecto. Uh, if you have any questions, we have like five minutes for them or, or 10 to five minutes. Yeah, so there are two ways to do that. Uh, ideally, you would use fragments, but that doesn't work always because you might not want, to, because uh, we can't express everything with fragments, but you, call, you, you can call the adapters directly where you just pass a SQL string and the, and the, query, and the query parameters. And that uses the same pooling from the repository and all that, so yeah. Any other questions? Uh, I'm not very aware of uh, LinQ. Uh, most of my time uh, working with database, it was working with Arrow and ActiveRecord. So my question is, how about uh, features that would allow you to compose a query in the way that Arrow allows you? Because I think that... Arrow? I'm not familiar with that. Arrow. Uh, ah. So, because one of the strongest points for SQL, I think it's mathematical background that defines very clearly rules how you can compose. 
Really? So I'm not super familiar with Active Record because or uh, or Rails. Um, so I'm not sure if I can answer that question very well. Jose can probably answer it very well. But I think that um, the query index we have today is very expressive. Uh, you can do almost anything with it. So uh, I'm not sure if you would need anything more than that. If Jose has any input. You have a question about, sorry, what? Uh, about callbacks. Um, so if you have, like, let's say, after after update callback or something like that. Yep. So, the same database so all callbacks runs we if it's if you have not defined an, a transaction yourself, we automatically wrap it in a transaction so that uh, the callbacks runs in the same transaction as the query that you're running. Yep. We don't. There is very many Postgres uh, data types, so we can't possibly support them all. And there are lots of extensions that we could also support. Uh, I hope that we can that we can ship with JSON support in the future. Um, but with active types and the database library that we're using, that is called Postgres. Uh, in Postgres, you can create extensions. So. If you create extensions for the data type, you can create extensions for all Postgres data types. And you kind of define, you kind of create your own encode and decode functions to between the serialized data type and the elixir terms. And with that and active types, you can do, uh, you can support any Postgres type. There's a question in the back as well. Um, so we have uh, uniqueness validation. Uh, that's not perfect because there's the race condition that you talked about, uh, and that would raise a adapter-specific extension, uh, which you can handle. Uh, but it's not really supported in Ecto. You kind of have to know the error code that you get from the adapter and handle that yourself. Yeah, that's an error code, yeah. Uh, you don't have to parse the string. You can match against. So uh, Martin recently uh, implemented a conversion between Postgres error code and Atom. So if you know the name for the, uh, for the failure, you can just match against that. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, in the front here. 
So uh, I thought I would support uh, Postgres and MySQL. Are there any plans for supporting something else like SQLite or Oracle? Um, there's no plans for SQLite or Oracle, as far as I know. And I'm not sure if anyone is working on it. Uh, we have plans for experimenting with NoSQL databases. So the SQL database is, is pretty straightforward to I implement for Ecto. So it's just a matter of someone doing it, right? Uh, either the core devs or someone contributing it. Uh, during the summer, we're, we're going to see how far we can get with NoSQL databases, if we can we can support NoSQL databases in, uh, uh, with the query language that they will have, the models that we kind of have, and so on. So after the summer, we will know if we can support NoSQL. Uh, SQL, we can easily support anything. Right, so, so kind of two questions. I'm going to answer the first one first. Uh, so the goal of Ecto was never to create a library for NoSQL databases. So we started out with just supporting Postgres, and as a side effect of that, it became kind of SQL-centric. Um, and that was always kind of the goal to, to support SQL databases, or that was the primary goal. Uh, now we're going to see if we can support NoSQL. If we can, that would be great. Uh, if not, that's OK, too. Uh, you can create um, other libraries that matches NoSQL semantics uh, uh, in a better way. Um, because I think it's going to be very difficult to support all NoSQL databases. Well, that's going to be impossible. Um, so no, NoSQL was never the primary goal. SQL was the primary goal. Um, and the second question is why we create uh, a DSL over SQL. And it's because the DSL and the models and the callbacks and the same sheets bring a lot of very useful features. Um, like the queries, how you can compose them, it's kind of, it's, it's very hard to compose just SQL strings, right? Um, and we still have like the protection against SQL injection and all that, and we have models and callbacks. Yeah, so I think it brings a lot over just pure SQL strings. Uh, another question? Yeah, exactly. No, but like I've said, the, the semantics for NoSQL is very, very different. And Ecto is targeted against SQL databases. So I don't think that we should try to like 
make the, the queries all work for NoSQL and make the models kind of work for key value stores and for document models and so on. I think if, if, if we can make it work, that would be awesome. Uh, but I'm not sure if it's going to work. So that's why we're going to work on it this summer and see how far we can get. Okay, any more questions? How are we in time? <coughs> okay. Thank you.